Okay, gang, page 64, Guru Ashurbach, chapter 3, figure and ground, primes versus composites. There's a strangeness to the idea that concepts can be captured by simple typographical manipulations. The one concept so far captured is that of addition and it may not have appeared very strange. But suppose the goal were to create a uh, for formal system with theorem of the form PX, the letter Y, no, sorry, the letter X standing for a uh, hyphen string and where the, one, where the only such theorems would be ones in which the hyperstring contain exactly a prime number of uh, hyphens. Thus, P dash 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 would be a theorem, but P dash 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 would not. How could this be done typo typographically? First, it is important to specify clearly what is meant by top typographical operations. The complete uh, repertoire has been presented in the MIU system and the PQ system. So we really only need to make a list of the kinds of things we have permitted. One, reading and recognizing any of a finite set of symbols. Two, writing down any symbol belonging to that set. Three, copying any of those symbols from one place to another. Four, erasing any of those symbols. Five, checking to see whether one symbol is the same as another six keeping and using a list of previously generated theorems the list is a little redundant but no matter what is important is that it is it clearly involves only trivial abilities each of them far less than the ability to distinguish primes from non primes how how then could we compound some of these operations to make a formal system in which primes are distinguished from composite numbers. The TQ system. A first step might be to try to solve a simple but related problem. We could try to make a system similar to the PQ system, except that it represents multiplication instead of addition. Let's call it the QC. TQ system, T for times, more specifically, suppose X, Y, and Z are respectively the numbers of hyphens in the hyphen string X, Y, Z. Okay. Notice I am taking special, special pains to distinguish between a string and the number of hyphens it contains. Then we wish to string X, T, y q z um, and there's a difference between capital x y z and x y z i should have emphasized that but this would be uh then we wish to string small case x t y q z to be a theorem if and only if capital x times capital y equals capital z for instance dash dash small t dash 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 q small q dash 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 should be a theorem be, because two times three equals six okay so two dashes small case t three dashes small case q four dashes so two times three equals six so t represents time q represents equals and the dashes represent two three and six but two dashes small case t two dashes small case q equals three dashes should not be a theorem which makes sense right because we're establishing a theorem two dashes times two dashes would equal four dashes not three dashes should not be a theorem the qt system can be characterized just about as easily as the pq system namely by using just one axiom uh, 
schism and one rule of inference. Axiom schism. Xt minus q x small case xt minus small case q x is an axiom where small case x is a hyphen string. Rule of inference. Suppose that small case x, y, and z are all hyphen strings. And suppose that small case x, t, y, q, z is an old theorem. Then small case x, t, y, dash, q, z, x is a new theorem. Before, below is the derivation of the theorem, double dash, small case t, triple dash, small case q equals six, or small case q, six dashes. I'm going to show you this. All right, so he's talking about this. The rule in France. Double dash, small case t, dash, small case q, two dash. So two times one equals two. That's the axiom up above at number one. Okay. By rule of an, and then number two and number three, by rule of inference using line one as the old theorem, by rule of inference using line two as the as the old theorem. So you build, you it's like mathematics. All of mathematics is built on five axioms, right? And you can from those axioms you can come up with new theorems. So that's what he's doing right here. Right. Notice how the mir middle hyper uh, hyphen string grows by one hyphen each time the rule of inference is applied so it is predictable that if you want a theorem with 10 hyphens in the middle you apply the rule of inference nine times in a row capturing complete uh, comp capturing compositeness okay compositeness multiplication a slightly trickier concept than addition has now been captured typographically like the birds in in an escher liber um, in escher's liberation what about um, primenessness here is a plan that might seem smart using a, using the tq system define a new set of theorems of the form capital C small case X which characterizes composite numbers as follows rule suppose small case X Y and Z are hyphen strings if X dash T Y dash Q Z all small case is a theorem then capital C Z is a theorem okay this works by saying that capital Z, the number of hyphens in small case Z, is a composite as long as it is the product of two numbers greater than one, namely capital X plus one, the number of hyphens in X, small case X hyphen, and capital Y plus one, the number of hyphens in small case Y hyphen. I am defi um, defending this new rule by giving you some, quote, intelligent mode, end quote, justifications for it. That is because you're a human being and want to know why there is such a rule. If you were operating exclusively in the, quote, mechanical mode, end quote, you would not need any justification since capital M mode workers just follow the rules mechanically and happily never questioning them apply to society in the last four years hello ken corner on rumble let's continue because you work in the i mode capital i mode you will need to blur blur in your mind to distinctions between strings and their um, interpretations you see things can become quite confusing as soon as you perceive quote meaning end quote in the symbols 
which you are manipulating. You have to fight your own self to keep from thinking that the string dash 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 is the number three. The requirement of formal formality, which in chapter one probably seemed puzzling because it seems so obvious, here becomes tricky and crucial. It is the essential, th essential thing which keeps you from mixing up the I mode with the M mode. Or said another way, it keeps you from mixing up uh, arithmetic facts with typographical theorems. It is very tempting to jump from the C-type theorems directly to P-type theorem by proposing a rule of the following kind. Proposed rule. Suppose small case X is a hyphen, hyphen string. If capital CX is not a theorem, then capital PX is a theorem. The fatal flaw here is that checking where, whether capital CX is not a theorem is not an explicitly typographical operation. To know for sure that capital MU is not a theorem of the capital MIU system, you have to go outside of the system. And so it is with this proposed, proposed rule. It is a rule which violates the whole idea of formal systems in that it asks you to operate informally, that is, outside the system. Typographical operation 6 allows you to look into the stockpile of previously found theorems, but this proposed rule is asking you to look into a hypothetical, quote, table of non-theorems, end quote. But in order to generate such a table, you would have to do some reasoning outside the system. Reasoning which shows why various strings cannot be generated inside the system. Now it may, now it may well be that there is another formal system which can generate the, quote, table of non-theorems, end quote by purely topographical means. In fact, our aim is to find just such a system. But the proposed rule is not a typographical rule and must be dropped. Dro dropped. This is, a, this, is, this is such an important point that we might dwell on it a little bit. A bit, dwell upon it a bit more. In our capital C system, which includes the TQ system and the rule which defines C-type theorems, we have theorems of the form capital CX with small uh, capital CX with small case X standing as usual for a hyphen string. There are also non-theorems of the form capital CX. These are what I mean when I refer to quote non theorems end quote, although of course TT dash CQQ and other ill formed messes are also theorems. The difference in that in that theorem, the difference is that theorems have a co uh, composite number of hyphens. Non theorems have a prime number of hyphens. Now the theorems all have a common quote form that is originate from a common set of typographical rules. Do all non theorems also have a common quote form in the same sense? Below is a list of C type theorems shown without their derivatives. The parentheses parenthesized numbers follow them, simply count the hyphens in them. So capital C four hyphens, capital C six hyphens, capital C eight hyphens, and so on, right? The holes in this list are the non-theorems. So there's a hole at capital C 
three uh, uh sorry five seven eleven thirteen seventeen so those would be the prime numbers right so it's missing the primes To repeat the, to repeat the earlier question, do the holes also have some quote form in common? Would it be reasonable to say that merely by virtue of being the holes in this list, they share a common form? Yes and no. That they share some typographical quality is un, uh, undeniable, but whether we want to call it quote form is unclear. The reason for hesitating is that this, the holes are only negatively defined. They are the things that are left out of a list which is positively defined. Figure and ground. Next little section. This recalls the famous artistic distinction between figure and ground when a figure or positive space example a human form or a let or a letter or a still life is drawn inside a frame an unavoidable consequence is that its uh, contemporary shape also called the ground or background or negative space has also been drawn complementary shape okay uh, ba, 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 ba. uh negative space has also been drawn in most drawings however this figure ground relationship plays little role the artist is much less interested in the ground than in the figure but sometimes an artist will take interest in the ground as well there are beautiful um, alphabets which play with this figure, figure ground distinction. A message written in such an alphabet is shown below. At first, it looks like a collection of somewhat random blobs. But if you step back a ways and stare at it for a while, all of a sudden, you will see seven letters appearing in this. Oh, yeah. <laughs> So I'm going to show it close up first. So here's close. Oh yeah, this comes out on. So close up. Let me see. Close up, right? You can pretty much see the box, the word box there, right? But then if you pull back, do you see it? Do you see this one over here? Oh, I saw it there for a second and it would disappear again. There's a sweet spot. There's a sweet spot. Mailbox. Right? Cool. Right? And you see it now again as well. Okay. For a similar effect, take a look at my drawing smoke signal figure. 139 oh we're gonna go to figure 139 139 it's like way out here okay i'm gonna to go to the table because we're gonna to go to figure 139 well, i want to see this we're gonna to go to the illustrate we're going to the table of contents for the illustrations Figure 139, smoke signal by the author is on page 702. So let's go to page 702. And this is what you do with this book. <laughs> oh, there it is. Ah, oh, here's a smoke signal. Let's make sure we don't lose this page. Here's the smoke signal. Do we see anything written there? There is. Message. So 
sorry if I'm moving it around, gang. this other one and then that's a version over there for a for a similar effect take a look at my drawing smoke signal along these lines you might consider this puzzle can you somehow create a drawing containing words in both the figure and the ground let us now officially distinguish between two kinds of figures cursively drawable ones and recursive ones by the way these are my own terms they are not in common usage a cursively drawable figure is one whose ground is merely an accident accidental byproduct of the drawing act a recursive figure is one whose ground can be seen as a figure in its own right Usually, this is quite deliberate on the part of the artist. The quote, re, end quote, in recursive represents the fact that both foreground and background are cursively drawable. The figure is, quote, twice cursive, end quote. Each figure ground boundary is a recursive figure in a double-edged sword. M.C. Escher was a master of drawing recursive figures see for instance this beautiful recursive drawing of birds figure 16. Right, this one so birds in the foreground and the background right or the ground so figure 16 tiling of the plane using birds by mc escher from a 1942 notebook okay our distinction is not as rigorous as one in mathematics for who can def definitively definitively say that a particular ground is not a figure once pointed out almost any ground has interests of its own in this in that sense every figure is recursive but that is not what i intended by the th by the term there is a natural and intuitive notion of recognizable forms are both the foreground and background background recognizable forms if so then the drawing is recursive if you look at the at look at the grounds of most line drawings you will find them rather unrecognizable this demonstration demonstrates that there exists recognizable forms whose negative space is not any recognizable form in more technical terminology this becomes there exists cursively drawable figures which are not recursive okay and those are sort of theorems that he's putting in because he's giving it indentations right there right scott kim's solution to the above puzzle which i call his figure 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 is shown in figure 17 if you read both black and white if you read both black and white you will see figure uh, everywhere but ground nowhere it is a paragon of recursive figures in this clever drawing there are two non-equivalent ways of characterizing the black regions let's see do we see figure oh there's 
this at you too. Oh, what a weird drawing. Interesting. It's hard to pick out. I see the F, I see the E, I see the G. Where's the R? Oh, I see the R. Interesting. Interesting. And this is Figure, Figure, Figure by Scott E. Kim, 1975. Number one. As the negative space to the white regions, number two, as altered copies of the white regions produced by coloring and shifting each white region. Okay. In the special case of the figure, 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 so figure dash figure, figure, the two characterizations are equivalent, but in most black and white pictures, there would not be, they, they would not be. Now in figure eight, oh, in chapter eight, sorry. Now in chapter eight, when we create our typographical number theory, TNT, oh, that's where, check this out. So in this part, typographical thing, TNT, Let's see if it focuses, right? Where's my bookmark? There it is. Here's, here's where my bookmark was. And here's the TNT. Chapter 18 or chapter 8? No, this one's chapter 15, jumping out of the system. So it defines that later on, right? It will be our hope that the set of all false statements of number theory can be characterized in two ana analogous ways. One, as a negative space to the set of all TNT theorems, two, as altered copies of the set of all TNT theorems produced by negating each TNT theorem. But this hope will be dashed because one, inside the set of all non theorems are found some truth, two, outside the set of all negated theorems are found some falsehoods. You will see why and how this happens in chapter 14. Meanwhile, ponder over a pictorial representation of the situation. Okay, figure and ground in music. And let's call it the segment reading there on page 70, right? So we went from page 64 to page 70, and we were already looking at figures and flipping back and forward. And this is the one he was talking about, the figure. Right. And it continues on from there. Guru Escher Bach, an eternal golden blade, a braid by Douglas R. Hofstetter. Fun read, exercise for the mind, right? Exercise for the mind. <laughs> 